As I record this, we have just a few days to go until Uphelia, Lerwick and Shetland's famous fire festival. I can almost barely believe I haven't presented on this subject before, but after a COVID-enforced two-year absence, we're finally gearing up for Europe's biggest fire festival once more. This will be a longer one for you, as there are a lot of elements to explain when it comes to Uphelia. So let's get right to it. What is Uphelia? I guess we'll start with the basics. At the heart of it, Uphelia is one of a series of fire festivals which take place throughout Shetland from January until March. The oldest, largest and most well-known of these takes place in Lerwick and is held on the last Tuesday of January. And that'll be the main focus of this recording because it's the one I'm most involved in and it's the one I know best. The Scatlowa Fire Festival interestingly not called up Helia, although it contains all the same features as the others do, kicks off the season on the second Friday of January each year, with festivals in Nestin and Garlsta, Bressa, Uwe Sound in Unst, Cullivo in Yell, Norwich also in Unst, Nortmaven and the South Mainland, culminating in Delton on the third Friday of March. In addition, there are also junior festivals held in Lerwick and by the Waz Brownies. As I've mentioned, there are a number of common features throughout all of these festivals. Vikings, a galley, flaming torches, squads, music, halls. So we'll go through each of these in turn after a quick history lesson to find out how the festival evolved into what it is today. History The origins of the name Uphelia are unknown, although the words have been taken to mean something along the lines of the last of the winter celebrations or the end of Yule which fits with the rough timing of the festivals, Lerwick being around the 24th night after Old Yule, which is the 6th of January. The festival becoming fixed to the last Tuesday in January came slightly later, as most businesses were shut on Wednesdays, so it made sense to have the party the night before. Fortunately for us, the origins of the festival itself are a bit more clear-cut, if no less strange than the name. It was tradition in Shetland to go guising at Christmas and New Year, that is, people would disguise themselves in costumes, sometimes made of straw, to visit their neighbours and they would only reveal themselves once they had been correctly identified. Following the Napoleonic Wars, the young men of Lerwick decided to introduce some of the elements they'd discovered while they were away, namely bright lights and loud noises, to what was otherwise a quiet and dark town. They created small bombs out of gunpowder and paper, which they called crackers, and used these to exact revenge on people who had wronged them over the past year, or also just to create a bit of noise and havoc. This eventually led to a new bright idea. Materials would be gathered, i.e. stolen, to build something known as a tar barrel. This contraption was sort of a wooden sledge pulled on chains or ropes, which was topped with anything from 6 to 12 barrels filled with tar, wood chips, shavings, old ropes, and basically anything else which could burn. These tar barrels were built by squads of around six men, who would then drag the burning tar barrels through the narrow streets of Lerwick, with the aim of discarding them either at the Market Cross or a rock known as the Coxstool, which is approximately where the breakwater of the small boat harbour is today. In the 1860s, some parts of Commercial Street were only about six feet wide, and the tar barrels could be up to four feet across. So if two of these tar barrels were heading in opposite directions and they met, it could often be a struggle to get by each other, and from this, violent fights would break out between the squads, and much damage was done to property and people, both deliberately as well as unintentionally. Unsurprisingly, the police of the time tried to crack down on this, but with limited success. On one occasion, a policeman was locked inside the toll booth by a tar barrel which was placed on the doorstep, preventing him from getting out. Whether the tar barrel made it to its intended destination, or if it was intercepted by the law on the way, was almost inconsequential. The whole point of it seems to have been the effort made and the fun had while doing so, and after the tar barreling finished for the night, a quick change of clothes was made into guising attire, and the squads would go to visit several private homes which were open for the night, and the rounds would be made through these homes until the following morning. Eventually it seems the boys themselves got bored of tar barreling and quarrelling with the authorities, and in 1881 a new element was introduced instead, the torchlit procession. This way the element of fire and the excitement that it brings was still present, but in a much safer and less destructive capacity. For 1882, the role of worthy chief geyser had been created to lead the festivities, and by 1886 he and the organising committee were in sole charge of the event. 
1889, another element which is synonymous with the festival was introduced, the Viking longship, or galley as it's known. This was really the beginning of the Nordic symbolism becoming a key part of Uphelia and led in 1906 to the change from the worthy chief geyser to the geyser Jarl, who was dressed in Viking regalia for the first time. In 1912, McGowan Scott, better known as Mackie, was the first to wear his Jarl suit all night rather than changing into that of his squad after the procession had finished. Following the interruption of the First World War, the festival resumed in 1920, and in 1921, the first Jarl squad came into existence, all dressed in Viking garb to match the Jarl. This was met with widespread acclaim and became a permanent fixture, and it's arguably the focal point of the festival today. By this time, all the key points of the festival were in place, and it's continued in more or less the same vein ever since. The only cancellations for the festival have been during wartime, 1915 to 1920 for the First World War, 1939 to 49 for the Second World War, the death of Queen Victoria and of course the Covid pandemic over the last couple of years, so 2021 and 2022. There have also been postponements for flu outbreaks on a couple of occasions as well as for the death of Winston Churchill. It's well known that there will be no postponement for weather, as is stated in the official programme produced annually for the festival. This history section has ended up slightly longer than intended, but I think it's important to give a background on how the festival came to be what it is now. And for more information on this, there are a few books which are well worth reading. Firstly, C.E. Mitchell's Uphelia, Tar Barrels and Guising Looking Back, which was originally published in 1947 and was recently republished. And also James W. Irvin's Uphelia, and I'll put links to those in the show notes or in the description down below. Vikings. As I've mentioned, the Jarl Squad came into existence in time for the 1921 festival following the Geyser Jarl's introduction in 1906 and the galley in 1889 as part of the growing Nordic element to the festival, so much so that they're now the focal point for the whole day. To become Geyser Jarl in Lerwick, I can't really speak for other festivals as I'm not so familiar with them, but they all follow a broadly similar route as far as I understand. One has to be elected onto the Uphelia committee. In Lerwick, this takes place at the first mass meeting of geysers at the end of October. It then serves on the committee for 15 years, organising the festival before gaining the honour of being Jarl in his 16th year. After this, he becomes the marshal and is responsible for overseeing all aspects of the festival the following year before stepping off the committee at the mass meeting in October. This means one man leaves the committee and one joins every year. In his Jarl year, he is equipped with a helmet, axe, shield, belt and dagger, which are handed on from one Jarl to the next. He also has a breastplate made for him, matching that of the previous Jarls. And the rest of his suit is made by himself and his squad on a theme they've chosen which is unique to them and changes from year to year. His Jarl squad, the group which accompany him on the big day, have been invited by the Jarl and is usually comprised of his regular squad, I'll come to that in a minute, plus friends and family members to create a larger than normal band dressed as Viking warriors. They too are equipped like a Viking raiding party with helmets, shield, breastplate and axes or swords. Sometimes more unusual weapons such as bows and arrows or spears are used instead or as well and they almost always have matching kirtles or tunics, cloaks, boots and sometimes trousers. As I mentioned before, the suit is unique to them and it changes from year to year. Even though the range of gear stays much the same, the variety of items and ideas from one year to the next is remarkable. The squad spends a full year and sometimes more, making their suits in a variety of venues, splitting into small teams to construct the various components of the suit, which have all been planned prior to this to ensure a cohesive outfit comes together. For example, I was part of the shield team for Jarl Mark Manson's squad in 2006, and I was a helmet maker for Ian Malcolmson's nesting Jarl squad in 2012. I consider myself extremely lucky to have been in both of these very different Jarl squads in two equally different but also similar festivals. I also have a third Jarl squad which I very much hope to be a part of in the future, which is my own. I had the immense privilege of being elected onto the committee in Lerwick in October 2018 ahead of the 2019 festival and I am scheduled to be Geyser Jarl in 2036, provided of course I make it that far and there are no more delays due to Covid or otherwise. The Galley. In addition to the Geyser Jarl and his squad, 
The other major Viking element to the festival is the galley, or longship. Indeed, it was the first Nordic introduction to Upelia in 1889, and came at a time of huge interest in Shetland into our Scandinavian past, and also the Romantic Nordic revival at large. At this time, Lerwick was expanding, the new town was being built, and the streets were named after Scandinavian kings, heroes and saints. King Harald Finehair, St Olaf the Holy, King Haken the Good, and St Sonova are all among those commemorated in the new street names. It is almost inevitable that this rediscovered identity, which was hugely popular at the time, found its way into the town's main festival. It should be said that the galley is not a reproduction of any actual Viking ship, and is instead rather a caricature version of one, with an overly pronounced head and tail among other things. No one could argue, however, that it isn't an iconic spectacle, and instantly recognisable as part of Opelia. The early galleys were built by the docks boys who worked in the area around what is now the Shetland Museum and Archives, and alongside these they produced a number of real replica warships such as the Dreadnought, Admiral Tojo's flagship and the Victory. From 1912, however, they concentrated solely on galley building. When the festival restarted in 1949 following the Second World War, the galley was built to templates created by Boaty Jimmy Smith, and they have followed the same design to the present day. While no longer built exclusively by the docks boys, the current galley builders have all learned from their techniques passed down over the years. Galley building starts in October and is only completed the day before Uphelia when the builders and painters put the finishing touches together, ready for the big day. Painting usually begins between Christmas and New Year when the team of dedicated painters take advantage of their holidays to assist in making the galley look good enough to burn. Aside from guising, my main involvement with the festival has been with the galley. First as a builder, and since joining the committee, I've joined the painters and look forward to continuing this role for many years to come. The galley is unveiled to the public at around 8am on Uphelia morning, when it is escorted into town by the Jarl Squad, the Brass and Pipe Bands, and also the Junior Jarl Squad during the morning procession. There are always large crowds gathered to catch the first glimpses of it, as its colour scheme is also a closely guarded secret. It is placed by the harbour for the day before it is taken up to the starting point of the procession, at the end of which it will be sent to Valhalla. Torches and the procession Of course, in order to have a torchlit procession and to burn a galley, we need torches. In Lerwick, these are made from wooden staves wrapped in hessian sackcloth, but each festival throughout Shetland has their own recipe, as it were, and the size and weight of the torches varies a great degree. In the town, torch building commences in November and is finished by mid-January. The torch boys work in on Tuesday and Thursday nights, alternating with the galley boys who are in on Mondays and Wednesdays. The torch boys make over a thousand torches for both the senior and junior processions, and once these have all been made and stacked, the base of the head is packed with fire cement to stop the flames burning down the shaft when it's alight. Once all this has been completed, the torches need to be transported to the steeping sheds, where they are soaked in paraffin for a time to ensure they burn for the full duration of the procession. By the time this stage is complete, the torches can weigh up to 15 pounds or 7 kilograms, a decent enough weight to carry around for an hour or so. The torches are handed out to the squads immediately prior to the procession, and if anyone isn't in a fit state to carry a torch, they simply do not get one. With thousands of spectators in attendance to watch the procession, there's no room for error on this point. At the appointed time, 7.30pm in Lowerwick, a rocket is fired and the torches are lit with flares. The streetlights have already been switched off by this point and the pitch black town is suddenly filled with an eerie red light filtered through the smoke. Photos can only capture part of the whole experience and mixed with the smell of the paraffin, the sound of the flares, excited children and adults in the crowds, the light up is an experience that needs to be witnessed in person to fully appreciate. Once all the torches are lit, the procession moves off, led by the Jarl in his galley, flanked by his squad, with all the others following behind in number order. The masked geysers snake their way through the streets of Larwick's new town, performing a spectacular looking turn in movement on King Harold Street, weather permitting, before winding their way into the North Jubilee Park for the climax of the procession. The squads circle the galley, forming an ever growing ring of fire around it until every geyser is in the park, marching in a clockwise direction and singing the Uphelia song. Once this is complete, they stop, and the Jarl Squad, in the very centre of the circle, begin to march anti-clockwise, as the galley song is sung. After the singing, the Geyser Jarl gives three cheers, each for the galley boys, the torch boys, and the festival, before the marshal raises three cheers for the Jarl, who then exits the galley post-haste. 
Once he's safely out, the fanfare is played by the brass band. And the geysers throw their torches into the galley, creating a spectacular bonfire reminiscent of a Viking funeral. The geysers reform the circle and sing the hymnal The Norseman's Home, which can be quite an emotional moment for some, before departing to make their rounds of the halls for the rest of the night and until the following morning. Squads. I've mentioned the squads a lot without really explaining what they are in any detail. Of course we've discussed the Jarl squad but it takes far more than just them to make an Ophelia. Back in the Tar Barland days a squad comprised of around six to eight men, often friends from the same street or lane or work colleagues and the like. Nowadays things are a bit more varied but there are still squads who come from particular areas, such as my own who are the old sound squad, although not all our geysers are from sound anymore. Or they come from shared occupations, such as the teacher squad, to give just a couple of examples. In Larwick, there are now 47 squads of varying numbers, up to no more than 25 geysers, plus musicians, and up to four fiddle box carriers. This somewhat unusual term is used to describe youths aged 12 to 15 who accompany the squad as sort of apprentice geysers, and the name comes from their former main duty, to assist the musicians and squad members into and subsequently out of the halls. From experience, I can tell you the latter is the much more difficult of those two tasks. Normally, the fiddle box carriers are the sons of squad members or their friends, so there's always a connection to the squad. When I turned 12, the sound squad had a full complement of fiddle box carriers, so I joined my friend in his dad's squad for a couple of years until a space opened up for me in my own squad, which is the one my dad, granddad, cousins, granduncles, great grandparents, and so on and so forth had all been in, and I've been with them now for over 20 years. Squads play a massive role on the night of the festival too. Each one is dressed in fancy dress on a particular theme, which they wear during the procession so the whole thing is a strange, fiery, masquerade carnival. This suit is also related to the act which the squad performs in each of the halls over the course of the night. This act might come in the form of a song, a dance routine, a comedy sketch, or some combination of those things, and it's to provide entertainment to the guests in the halls. Usually these would be based on some topic or event which has taken place over the previous year, either locally, nationally or globally, but they can be based on absolutely anything or absolutely nothing, as the case may be. Let's just say the quality of these acts can vary significantly from squad to squad and from year to year. We've had some absolutely atrocious acts over the years, matched by some surprisingly good ones too. There's absolutely no competitive element to the festival though, it's all about having fun together with your squad and the guests in each hall, which is kind of part of the beauty of the whole thing. Only one member of the committee, the secretary, knows what each squad will be out as for Ophelia, and it's his responsibility to ensure there's no repetition of an idea between squads, so there's a variety of acts doing the rounds on the night. Not only can there be no repetition within the same year, but also squads can't repeat an idea which has been used in the previous five Ophelias, meaning there's a huge amount of inventiveness and creativity which goes into getting a squad out for the night. I think our worst act in my time was in 2005, when the idea of building a bridge or a tunnel to Bressa was big in the headlines. So we dressed as moles and tunnelled, crawled, under Bressa Sound, a blue tarpaulin on the floor, while the ferry crew and harbour master looked on. It really was as bad as it sounds. In recent years we've improved though, and some highlights were recreating the cover of the Beatles classic Sgt Pepper's album in 2017 for its 50th anniversary, or our last minute 2019 effort featuring the four Nicholson Jarls, a father and three sons who all became Geyser Jarl, the youngest of them in 2019, touring around Shetland via a series of doctored signs to local landmarks. Our 2014 ukulele orchestra wasn't bad either, and it's safe to say that adding a live band to our squad has helped immeasurably, which leads us nicely on to our next topic. Music. If there was no music associated with Uphelia, it simply would not be the same festival, and this was recognised very early on in the proceedings. In 1897, J.J. Halden Burgess, Lerwick's famed blind poet, author and academic, wrote the words to the Uphelia song, which was the first of many songs written especially for the festival, thus giving another unique identifying feature to Ophelia. 
Initially, it was sung to the tune of John Brown's Body, but for 1921, Thomas Manson wrote a new melody, which was better suited to the song. And it's this version which is sung to this day as the main song of the festival. As Irvin says in his book, Surely there are few Shetland hearts which fail to beat a little faster when they hear the strains of this song. the only song which has been penned for the festival though. John Nicholson wrote the words to the galley song, sung to a traditional Norwegian tune, especially for the festival in 1935, and it was initially performed while the galley was stationary during the turning movement, and it's now sung when the galley is in position in the burning site prior to the torches being thrown. That same year, The Norseman's Home was sung after the torches had been thrown into the galley, partly to prevent the geysers from leaving the burning site quite so abruptly. It had, however, been sung during the procession since at least 1896, and was really the first song to become associated with the festival. Again, it's sung to a Norwegian melody, and as I mentioned above, it definitely has the sounds of a hymn to it. Little wonder, then, it has become the national anthem of Shetland as well. All of these songs have been recorded and are available to listen to year-round, either on CD from High Level Music in Lerwick, or on various streaming services such as Spotify, Apple Music and even YouTube. These songs, along with another of similarly stirring marches, are played by the Lerwick Brass Band during the procession. They have an association with it Opelia going back as far as 1888. The Brass Band have the additional honour of playing the Jarl up the ranks as he and his squad march between the two rows of geysers on the hill head, taking their position at the head of the procession. They are also normally joined by the Lerwick Pipe Band, and sometimes also pipers from Kirkwell in Orkney who will travel north to bolster the numbers of pipers for the day. Both bands certainly add an air of ceremony and importance to the festival, and it definitely wouldn't be the same without their presence. 
In addition, the halls are also full of music for the whole night too, each one with a dance band installed on stage for the duration. Most play tunes for Scottish country dances, the Boston Two Steps and Baroner's Waltz and the proper Strip the Willow, we'll have none of that Orcadian nonsense here, thank you very much, being some of the more popular dances chosen on the night. Although some of the hall bands will play more modern music for dancing to between the acts as well. Each squad has some sort of musical soundtrack to it as well, sometimes performed live and often comprising more than one song per act as well, so there is definitely a lot of music played during the course of the night as the 47 squads pass through each hall. Halls. At this point, the halls have been mentioned a lot, and you probably have a pretty good idea what they are and what goes on in each one by now, but they are such a massive part of what makes the festival the success that it is, and they fully deserve a section to themselves. Originally, the halls were the private homes of the Lerwick Worthies in the 1800s, which were open for geysers to visit at Christmas, New Year, and up Helia. As time went on, the latter became the most important geysing night, and the festival began to grow. Before too long it had outgrown people's homes and by 1903 some houses grouped together and hired both the Rechabite and the Masonic Halls to provide more space for geysers and guests. By 1925 there were no private homes open and instead the post-procession parties were held exclusively in halls as they have been ever since. And calling them parties is exactly the right term for they are private parties organised by their hosts and predominantly hostesses. There are currently 11 halls open in Lerwick Country festivals vary from one to six halls, and around these the squads must travel in order over the course of the night, starting at 9pm and finishing the last one by 8am the following morning, and it's little wonder that the Wednesday is a public holiday in Larwick after that. The venues for these parties range from community halls to sports centres and schools, and most are attended by invitation with only two halls, the Town Hall and the British Legion, putting tickets up for sale to the general public, and these always sell out quickly. The setup in each hall is broadly similar. Each has a stage and a dance floor with seating for attendees around the edges, the dance floor doubling up as the performance area for each squad. Each also has a supper room, or at the very least a defined area away from the dance floor for eating. A range of sandwiches, sausage rolls, bannocks, soup, home bakes and tea or coffee are served on a constant basis by the hostesses and their helpers, each taking a shift on the kitchen rota. Most halls also have a separate drinking room away from the dance floor too, although some have bar facilities available. It suits some people to suggest that the committee are solely responsible for Uphelia, but everybody involved knows that the festival would not be possible without the dedication and downright hard work of the hosts and hostesses of these halls. The three cheers given to them by each visiting squad is only a small gesture of the appreciation and esteem with which they are held for their huge contributions to our great festival. This has been an extremely long one, so if you've made it this far, I think you should give yourself three cheers. Of course, this is only an introduction to Uphelia too. There's still so much more to it than I've been able to explain here. If you'd like to learn more, the two books I've mentioned way back near the start of this are an excellent starting point for you, given a great history of the festival from its earliest days. Through the summer months, there's also the Uphelia exhibition, which is worth a visit. I've produced content on that on just about every single social media platform, and there are links to that below. If you're visiting for Uphelia this year, you've been before, or you haven't made it yet, but you want to in the future, let me know in the comments below or via the website adventureshetland.com. I'm John from Adventure Shetland, and I would like to wish you a safe and successful Uphelia season wherever in the world you are celebrating.